But they didn't stop there. They Fuck added it to royals. rum. They added it to coffee. They added it to cigarettes and smoked it. And they used it as an aphrodisiac. Why do people do this? Why? Hello everybody, Jack here with another reaction here to check out some more from the end of the historian on the Fancy series. This is the third install third installment into this series, properly called Fans C. He should have called it Found Tree. It would have been a bit more punny, just like the fan fantastic title for that awful Fantastic Four movie some years ago. But I have made an observation uh, to the Internet Historian's content uh, relating to some of the people that he has collabed with in the past. For example, Ordinary Things is now doing less ordinary things and actually conducting straight up historical concepts and geopolitical stuff, of course, a bit more serious concept that is. Whereas Anthony Historian is covering more simpler things, at least with this series. But let's be honest, most of us have never come here to like, get extreme breakdowns of very complex topics. It's for the great delivery of these things that we might not know that are kind of obscured. But that being said though, I'm super interested in what these oddities that he mentions in the title are supposed to be. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Brought to you by NordVPN. Nord. That's green screen. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so used to seeing rotoscoping because I do that sometime when I'm editing things. So yeah, they stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> well, hello there. Oh, it's you. You've completed the crash course on theatre and wine, have you? Mm -hmm. Feeling smug, are we? Deserving of love, perhaps? Just a little Worthy bit. of eye contact. <laughs> That's cute. But there's still a lot more work to be done. Well. Look here. These shoes are made from real Italian leather. This bag is made from the leather of real <laughs> Italians. Not impressed? How yeah. about this fur coat? It's made from the wolf of Wall Street. And I was about to say that it's made out of actual hair. That would have freaked me out. Because, like, letter of things we've seen before. There was a recent case on a university where a book, well, several books actually were found. Harvard. It was from Harvard where a book made by a French doctor was uh, recently removed that was at least that had a cover made out of human skin. One of the myriad of examples of what is called anthropodermics put on display. Yeah, I know that this might not be the thing that you wanted to hear in the beginning here, but it all takes place during uh, the uh, Great Purge in France where they have way too many bodies lying around. So some people decided that that would have been a great idea. I guess on the positive side of that is that you are not cutting down trees and it's more... Green. An Xbox with the original PT demo still installed. A signed first edition copy of Moby Dick with its little known sequel, Moby Ball. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, The Squid from Squid, Squid Game. Game. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Don't you get it? Oddities. Weird stuff. I mean, the, the first section's on perfume. Listen, I'm going to level with you. I kind of got distracted <laughs> and uh, we went off topic. I don't even okay. know what this is about anymore. Here's my Netflix stand-up special. It should explain everything. Wow. <laughs> Long factory. That's going to be a hard act to follow. That Kramer guy has some very good one-liners. But I've got some jokes lined up. <clears throat> Question. <laughs> Why is perfume so expensive? Because you have to pay... Perfume. Oh, God. Why do they call it cologne? Because it's... Have you ever smelt one of those? It ain't great. Mate, mate, oh. mate, hold, 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 hold on, hold on. 
I know the comedy is bad here, but it's an actual good question. Why do they call it cologne? Because to my understanding, it's one of those where like the etymology is all over the place. Because cologne is in Germany, and the dude who made cologne, which basically is a shortened word for eau de cologne in French, uh, the dude who made it is Italian. And somehow the French got hold of that thing. Why is the right question here? Anyways, uh, fruit for your thoughts. It must not be working. The, uh, deodorant in this market? I'd want a deodorant buy. Is this thing on? Okay, let me tell you the story of perfume. See, to be fancy... I'm happy that they didn't make a Kramer joke, because Kramer's jokes went really out of hand fast. People wanted to stink good, but people naturally stink bad. Yes. It's science. So in the beginning, people went to the garden to find the best smelling things that they could. Here's a photo of the oldest perfume bottles ever found. And what's inside? Just garden stuff that smells nice. Mm. But we did not just stop at that, because the story of perfume is the story of progress. What is the thing that um, Vesemir, yes, from The Witcher Tree, says to Geralt in the beginning of the first conversation? Uh, yeah, it does smell it does like smell lilac, lilac like and gooseberries, gooseberries uh, referring to Yennefer of Vangerberg. Yeah, those were like oils, uh, essential oils that you will take from both the grapes of the gooseberries, or the berries of the gooseberries, those oils and extract from the lavender and make it into perfume. And they did these things all the way back in the Middle Ages. I think that the lavender part was invented by the Arabs, where gooseberries is a European thing. By the time Cleopatra came around, perfume science had really advanced. Ooh. You see, Cleopatra loved perfume. In fact, it was said that she had a whole perfume factory. The old factory, I believe they called it. But this factory wasn't just mashing flowers. They were using emulsifiers, adding resins, creating tinctures. Cleopatra's very own Chanel No. 1 contained cardamom, cinnamon, olive oil and myrrh. Oh. So we've gone from garden to pantry. <laughs> and she loved spritzing the stuff everywhere. Supposedly even spraying it all over the sails of her ship. Her signature scent. You could smell her from miles off as she sailed the Nile. Yeah. By the early Middle Ages, we had figured out the formula for perfume. Effectively, there are three main components. Water, alcohol, alcohol and, and the oil. most important bit the aromatic oils. Yeah. And by the way, perfume and cologne are actually the same thing, but in different ratios of these ingredients. By the 1600s, they were trying all sorts of different things. Some things went well. Dude. Pine. Pine. <laughs> what about orange? I call it new car smell. But once global trade opened up, our tastes became more exotic. Out of the pantry and into the petting zoo. For you see, oh, it animals. turns out that animals have been hoarding all of the most bestest perfume smells. Jesus. Yes. In the olden days, a bunch Whales. of manly men would brave very rough seas in order to pull aboard sperm whales. Now, they would cut open the digestive tract and pluck out a secretion of bile called Wait. ambergris. Or in oh, English, grey amber. Wait, is this where it comes from? From whales? I'm, I'm shocked here. I, I, I know of grey amber, but I thought it was a synthetic thing. Wait, I'm so confused because he is using the clip of um, the movie with Hemsworth and uh, Tom Holden. Uh, what the fuck is it called? The way where they are... At hard at sea, uh, even Killian Murphy is uh, playing in it, uh, the dude from Picky Blinders and Oppenheimer. But in this movie, they are wailing, which is a completely different thing. I mean, of course, unless you want to smell like a person working with the thing closest to fracking, perhaps that's what you want to have, but <laughs> I was kind of misled with the clip that he decided to use there. 
But okay, let's hear where he's going to. Sometimes they would harvest the rest of the whale, but eventually ambergris became so valuable that it was simply more economical to dump the carcass back in the ocean and collect the next batch. Come on. Like when you kill a racehorse for its prize-winning jizz and then just leave it there on the tracks. All right, quick science lesson, eggheads. Ambergris comes from the gross part of the whale. And when the whale eats something quite sharp, let's say human bones, the ambergris forms around them and protects the lining of the gut. That's the ambergris role. That way, as the sharp thing continues down the intestines, the whale doesn't get poked. Oh. But if ambergris comes from a whale's digestive tract, what does it smell like? Surely not good. When it's dry, it smells kind of woody and earthy. But when it's wet, it smells like ass. Ugh. But it's not actually the smell that's the useful function. Ambergris is a fixative. So what it does is heighten and bring out the scent of other things. Just like how bacteria are the things that actually enhances the smell of our clothes or on our skin. Which is why you need to wash yourself when you are sweating and or, well, wash your clothes. Because it's literally the bacteria that enhance the smell and produce that scent or musk <laughs> if you're a freaking deer <laughs> or Elon. I'm going to Photoshop an image of Elon uh, on a deer's body just for funsies. These flowers, they smell all right, but add some ambergris and ah, that's the one. Now, once they figured this out, they realized, oh, there's a whole bunch of things we can use a fixative for. And they got quite gross with it. They added it to food. Oh, no. In fact, it was said that King Charles's favorite dish was ambergris on eggs. But they didn't stop there. They added Fuck it to royals. rum. They added it to coffee. They added it to cigarettes and smoked it. And they used it as an aphrodisiac. Why do people do this? Why? Look, I... I know that throughout our history, a bunch of things have been used as aphrodisiacs, like uh, cobra venom. No, cobra blood has been used for that. Um, uh, rotten cheese. What else? Uh, that's a good one uh, having to do with dog embryos. I swear to God. <laughs> like, there's some things out there that people really have been messing up with. Now, uh, one thing that I know is not true, that was a myth for quite some time, um, the whole thing with uh, rhino horns, that is supposedly used by a lot of Chinese oligarchs or rich people over there as uh, to make like horny pills. No, it's not an actual thing. It's a weird myth that was perpetuated for quite some time. Yet still, they do partake in the poaching. That is bad. But yeah, uh, whale secretions used as aphrodisiacs. Fun fact of today. <laughs> now, some people will say that the whale is a mammal. But that's not strictly true. It is in fact a fish. Just look at <laughs> the tail. And you may have also heard that there are a lot fewer of them these days. Which, although a relief because their absence helps offset the sea level change climate whatever, Bruh. we were worried that we might run out. So we said no more hunting whales for ambergris. But did that stop the perfumers? No. They immediately asked, hey, do you think there are any other animals that smell kind of weird? Yes. Yeah. Turns out the musk, uh, musk deer has deer. some potential. Now we hunt the male musk deer specifically because it has a particular gland called a musk pod, which when dried out looks like this. Ugh. And it uses it to mark its territory and attract mates. Now don't worry, unlike ambergris, this doesn't smell like ass. Ammonia? Instead, it smells like ammonia and piss. Yeah. Uh, as a lifter, that, that tends to be a joke that some tend to use uh, because people tend to smell, um, smell ammonia in, in order to like center themselves in to make a lift. And, uh, bleh, yeah, it, it, we tend to joke that it smells like the, the musk of a deer. 
and you just can't get a smell like that at home. So we started hunting them to the point where they were a protected species. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> so the authority said, you have to find a different animal. So from there, they moved on to Hyrax feces. Hey, the One camera of the guy. Most feared and dangerous animals in all of Africa. And it was the inspiration for the original Lynx Africa smell. Now, their feces, when dried, is called Hyracium or Africa Stone. That's an upcoming movie. But it's not just these ones, they have other stones in Africa. Come on, guys. <laughs> now, the smell is fairly similar to deer musk, but unlike the deer, the Hyrax doesn't need to be killed or disturbed for their feces. They're just giving it away. In fact, Hyrax even have a communal toilet, which is used for generations, which makes it very easy to collect up all the good stuff. Stop using animal poop for everything, from coffee to scent to things that you add in your meal. Ugh. Ugh. Ugh, people. Brother, ugh. I, I mean, like, the closest thing that I will understand is like the uses of that for like cultivation of fruits. Which I guess, like, uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's the whole cycle of life. So why don't we break one of the one of the, the component of the chain and go straight to the bloody thing? But fuck, <laughs> it's nasty. Also, by the way, if uh, those of you may not have understood the uh, camera guy joke that I made there, it's because of an edit that I did for the um, Casual Geographic video that unfortunately was taken down from his channel. And mine as well, since I reacted to it. But yeah, mountain hyrax are great climbers, and I joke to the fact that they will always be the equivalent of the camera guy who gets on top and always records things for the people who are climbing behind them. It's not just the hyrax, I've got other animals. Remember those civets from the virus videos? <laughs> Wait, don't wash that thing's anus. Mom, mom, get the bottle, get the bottle. Turns out it's the anal gland of the civet that's actually the important smelling bit. <laughs> Who's figuring this out? Why don't they use the good parts of the animal? The, it's the bacon part of the bee. You know, anyway, it's the ass that produces all the delicious musk. It smells like shit. <laughs> you don't it say. Must be good for something because it goes for four thousand dollars a kilo. But we ain't done yet. You know when you've just killed a beaver and you cut open its ripe abdomen? Well, the reason it smells so good is because of a little gland called the castor sac, which makes a yellowy scum-like substance called castorium, and it is used to waterproof the beaver's fur coat and also mark its territory. It is also very fragrant. And you know what that means. If it smells, it sells. And in this case, castorium is more kind of leathery, with smoky hints of vanilla. But unfortunately today, you're not allowed to harvest the beaver. They're walking around very smugly, just like the other protected animals. But you know what? We don't need them, because we have a synthetic version of castorium now, oh, and it's just yeah. as good. And Fantastic. You know what? We've got a synthetic for the whale, the deer, and mm. the civet now. And they're used in lots of mainstream perfumes. Modern day, we've Midnight got a synthetic poison. version of practically everything. And even better, the advancement of synthetics has opened up a huge range of smells that were never possible to distill Jesus. or capture before. Don't you hate it when you go to like a locker room and people just spray themselves in axe body spray? Or perfume for that sake. Like, what? Can't people just take a bath? And like, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying because I think that a lot of the perfume that people take are like very invasive, like pungent. It's too much. I have one perfume that I've used for years now. And that thing smells of coconut. Like, if you truly have trouble with smell, man, use an antiperspirant. <laughs> it's not that difficult. And the result is some very silly perfumes. You know that bacon bit of the pig? We got that now. <laughs> Windex smelling, pretty much anything you can think of really, someone has created a fragrance of it. In some instances, wait! Think of really. Funeral home! <laughs> Over the toast. Oh, 
Oh my god, this is that great. Someone has created a fragrance. The flame grilled. Holy shit. 5,000 yen. That's what? 4,000. You are a dead man. No, so sorry for the joke. If you're Japanese, I just can't remember what it goes for. What is 5,000 yen in dollars? Okay, $32. It's still a lot for a flame grilled smell. In some instances, we're even beating nature herself. For example, you know those roses that you get at the florist? And then yeah. people go, ah, oh, they smell beautiful. But actually, those roses are not bred to smell good. They're so specialized for good looks, longevity, and disease resistance that they've practically altogether lost their smell. Oh. So often what the florist will do is add an additional scent to the flower post-picking. <laughs> and typically a synthetic rose perfume is used because it lasts longer and doesn't dry out the flower. Wow. Yep, we're just that good. And what's the future for perfumes? Well, I don't know. But what I do know is it's going to involve some comedy gold. Anyway. Bruh. It's definitely going to involve a lot more ass. Ass smell. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah. My wife asked me for Chanel number five, and I was like, huh, not right now. I'm watching the football. I get it. You know, Channel you know, five. Play on the television. Shut up. <laughs> you know what? I am going to say it. If it's good enough for Kramer, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Ad time. Oh, this God. Christmas, she works in the big city. Busy professional. My career, this and that. But she's going home for Christmas. Small towns are the worst. I'm a big city career gal. Oh, my God. Are you okay? <laughs> I am now. And she's about to learn the meaning of Nordmas. The most vpn is time of year with a 30-day money-back guarantee if you go to nordvpn.com slash internet historian. Ha 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 ha. Soon I will have installed public Wi-Fi in all of Nordville. And once they use it, their private data will be exposed. Governor Craven's got this town by the balls. Wow. And I can't believe that big city company you work for works with him. Come on, we have to put up the Nordmas lights for the big Nordmas festival. What? <laughs> Let's go ice skating. <laughs> what? <laughs> He's so cute, but I'm a city girl. Girl, you sound like you're in love. <laughs> I thought I knew what Nordmas meant, but it means nothing without you. It's like the end of March. It's always <laughs> Nordmas time of year with Nord's huge discount on a two-year plan. Use the URL. NordVPN.com slash internet story of a 30-day money-back guarantee is the best VPN in town. Now I love small town. And I'm in love with Nordman. But I can't leave behind big city Korea. True Hello. love and a really good VPN don't come around too much. You gotta take a chance. Boss, I don't care about making partner at the firm anymore. I've found my new home. Big public Wi-Fi is spreading across the city. Nordmas will be ruined. Ho, ho, ho. Need a hand? How are we going to stop him, Nordman? With this Nord-themed brick. <laughs> I love you, Nordman. And I love you, big city woman. Let's go home and watch the international Netflix catalog. It's a Nordmas miracle. Go to nordvpn.com slash internet historian to get a huge deal on a two-year plan plus four bonus Nordmas months. I must admit, uh, this is the least destructive Nordman ad that he has ever made. Usually, like, the city's laying in ruins. So, uh, progress. Ad's over. You know, that ad makes me think about the time I nearly had a wife. Feels like a lifetime ago now. Y you do? I was in Japan, living the digital nomad lifestyle. I had a startup selling seashells down by the seashore. <laughs> but I broke the one rule of being a digital nomad. I got mad. Digitally. <laughs> and that's when I saw her. It was love and- That is so bad. 
Oh, that is so bad, but I love it. I love it. At first sight, I remember her laugh. <laughs> her touch. Every morning, breakfast in bed. But the truth was, I had no money. We couldn't live on love alone. So I left. I saw it. Oh. Oh. And I bet you're wondering how I finally struck it rich. <laughs> I really wish I got to hear that segment of Shark Tank there. I suppose it was copyright uh, struck for that. Well, truth is, I'm the guy who invented the Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> Once I became a gajillionaire, I went back to that beach to try and find her. <laughs> but instead, I hit her with my boat. We never found her body. But she had a secret. One she took to her grave that I was sworn not to tell. She's not around, so... Dude, she was a mermaid! I think we all Come guessed on, that. Come on, we're going to Japan. And here's... But big question, though. Uh, does she have the uh, lower fish half on when you... I don't know if they did the thing. We don't need to get into the details. I'm sorry for bringing that up. This is where it all begins. In the year 2022. It's a Tuesday, probably. And local folklore researcher Hiroshi Kinoshita is looking up some fantastical animals <laughs> in the National Yokai Dictionary. It's like the bestiary from Witcher, right? And he comes across a photo negative of a mermaid mummy. Oh my god, he says in Japanese. Upon seeing the mermaid, he knows that he must track it down. He must form a team. Researchers, assemble. I know of Ningen. That's like an urban legend, more like of a white creature shaped like a man. <laughs> there are always like great memes made out of it. So he gets together the best damn crew that he can from the University of Science and to track o only down in Japan. The That's fun. Mummy, wherever it has escaped to. Now it doesn't take him long to figure out that it's being held at the Inuin Temple in Asakuchi. You know the one. So he struts up to the sacred building. And there at the back of the temple is a fireproof safe. And inside of that is an old wooden box. And inside the old wooden box was the mermaid. We found it! We found a real one! But where did it come from? Well, alongside the mermaid was a note that dated back from 1903, and it said, A dried human fish, aka Ningyo, was caught almost 300 years ago over in the seas of Tosa. It was then dried out and taken to Osaka. And from... Uh, okay, so look, I, I know of like mummification to a certain degree but they never get this small this sounds like one of those scams similar to those aliens that were shown in the US court not too long ago from those uh, uh, that Mexican dude who claimed to have found mummies or no, not mummies aliens <laughs> you know the ones from there it was passed around to many different people until it arrived at the temple now, the Ningyo have an important history in Japan, and sightings of these half-fish, half-human creatures have cropped up all across the country. Kinoshita himself had personally tracked down 13 of them all across Japan, usually kept in museums and temples. Where? However, what you might not know is that traditionally they have been associated with bad omens. But of course. And everyone knows the infamous tale of Yao Bikuni. No. But I'll recite it to you just in case. <laughs> so the story is that one day, a poor fisherman catches the biggest fish of his life. It was a strange looking fish. Oh. And its head was almost human-like. But he brought the fish home and invited all of his friends and family to come over for a feast to celebrate that his largest catch. You know, he's got his arms stretched out like this. He's like, it was this big. No, it was this big. I swear, it was this big. During dinner, 
one of the guests sneaks into the kitchen to see just how big it was. This big, I can't believe. <laughs> and he discovers that it is actually a ningyo. Oh no, he says in perfect Japanese. <laughs> now he quickly warns the other guests, Yamate. don't eat it. And he warns them just in time. Teishi. They've got their fork like right up to their mouth. Teishi eating that. Teishi, don't do it. My wee brain is just thinking just like what anime characters will say. But yeah, Teishi also means stop. They throw all their food away. <laughs> Let's just have some rice and drink the night away. Yeah, okay. all. <laughs> so they do. And they have a lovely evening. However, one very dishonorable guest decided to sneak a bit of the meat out of the trash and put it in his pocket. He then goes home drunk and falls asleep. He didn't eat it. But when he woke up the next morning, he checks his pockets and... <sighs> no! The delicious fish piece is gone! Turns out, in the night, his daughter had been rummaging around in his pockets looking for treasure <laughs> and she found the meat from his pocket. And, and she, she was such a greedy guts that she, she decided to eat it then and there. The father oh, no. was terrified for his daughter. But she didn't seem to be sick. Do you feel weird at all? And it's shaking her. He decided not to tell her anything. Maybe it'll all be okay. However, from that day forward, the daughter never aged. That's right. She remained a young adult forever. Yeah. She eventually went on to marry, but as her husband got older, she stayed the same age. Eventually her father got old and died, and soon enough <laughs> did her husband too. Everyone she ever knew was getting older and dying, but she remained the same age. She was immortal. Eventually, at age 120, she decided to shave her head and become a Japanese nun. She oh. traveled the country, planting trees as she went. And she did this for 800 years. Damn. But eventually, she grew tired. You know what? I'm tired of living. She entered a cave in her hometown of... Obama. <laughs> <laughs> and she was determined to never come out again. <laughs> She begged and prayed for the curse to end, but it never did. Okay, so Yaobikuni means 800-year-old nun, but often 800 is used as a number that figuratively means ad infinitum. So yeah, close to infinite, oh, immortal, unending, or an uncountable large number. So effectively, it's saying that she is very, very old, to the point of unknown rather than Literally, exactly, 800. All right. She sat in that cave for so long that she turned to stone. I and beg your today, at the Kuinji Temple in Obama, remains the cave that <laughs> Yao Bakuni entered. Don't People say it. People have been into that cave to check whether she's still in there. Don't say but it. But nothing was found. However, a stone statue of her resides at the entrance. And colloquially, it is called the Bar Rock Obama. So we're back with her. I fucking knew it! <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Hiroshi. He asked the Inuin temple if he could borrow the Nino. Look, let me do a little CT scan on it, right? And they have <laughs> scan on the keyboard, and here are the results. It's stage four cancer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, turns out the Nino dates back to the 1800s. Uh -huh. The note that said it was from the 1700s was so new. Its body is made from cloth and cotton wrapped in pufferfish skin. The tail was made from a croaker. I don't know what that is. What is Can we show that on the screen? A fish. With the mouth of a different fish and the hair of a mammal. And they can see that there's a metal nail in it. Oh, back. God. Oh, my God, it's invented tools. I. <laughs> the forensic analysis and the construction materials in its back did cast some doubt over its authenticity. 
But you gotta believe in something, damn it. <laughs> Aye. As promised, the Nino was returned to the NUN temple, where it still lives today. But where, oh where, did my mermaid go? <gasps> it's her! You're, you're back! You know what, I, I kind of missed you. And... What the hell is that? Daddy. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> the did the thing. You know what? I never did find her again. I think these things are a big myth. <laughs> the did the thing. The did the thing. <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh. <-Oh. laughs> We're here on the ancient streets of Cairo, and there is our destination. In these Kisa. triangles. The greatest luxury that all the elites crave. Oh god, no, no not, not that. <laughs> the, the second most thing that... Mummies! You can find them in these tombs and there's only ever like one dude guarding them. But before we take, we must understand. Mummification started over 5,000 years ago. And they were first discovered by the Europeans in the 15th century. I... The legend goes, the locals knew about them even earlier than that. It's an elaborate process, but essentially, you're drying the person out, turning them into a human salami. All right, so when the Europeans found all these mummies, what do you think they did? Well, uh, they'll put it in a museum, right? Wrong. They used these mothers for everything, and everybody wanted them. What do you mean they used them for everything? Well, fancy people would take... Yes, yes, I was waiting for him to actually have visuals for this instead of commenting on it. To think that again, rich people want the actual fuck. Take whole mummies and show them off to their friends at fancy dinners. To really show off the owner's wealth, they would sometimes unwrap them too. They were used as paint. They call this mummy brown, by the way. They were used as fertilizer. Talk about supercharging your soil. <laughs> they were even consumed. Don't mind if I do. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know that it's not quite the same thing, but Europe also has one interesting history of cannibalism. Uh, some of you may know of the Sunny Bean clans. Uh, there was in 2001, like a whole thing in Germany with... <laughs> quite a horror story kind of similar to uh, the Hannibal Lecter tale but straight up a guy posted something online like a request of people willing to partake in uh, their own sacrifice and their own consumption and literally a dude showed up and did that I don't know if the individual was suicidal hopefully not or was perhaps mentally ill I don't know <laughs> weird things have happened and this is but one of them they, they use also mummies as medicine suppositories and weird stuff like the shit that we've done in the past is ugh. and the fact that some people still i guess to this day in some kind of underground traffic are doing these things is sickening no not like this by grinding them up into powder and taking them like a herbal supplement, which they called Mumia. But with such high demand for your mum, after a while, they began to run out of stock. No shit. Uh-oh. They were becoming rarer and rarer to find. They were being gobbled off the face of the earth. So the authorities passed a bunch of laws to protect mummies from becoming altogether extinct. These are the last two of their species, and they're both male, but they won't mate. No. But the mummy is much like the Tasmanian tiger. Every once in a while, one will just kind of show up. up and prove that they're not altogether extinct. <laughs> oh, man, <you're> your... <laughs> the year 2013. The location, Dyfus in northwest Germany. Why is it always Germans? <laughs> And the French. We are at the Kettler household, owned by Grandfather Kettler, who is now dead. <laughs> but he had a son, Lutz Kettler. And Lutz Kettler also had a son, Alexander Kettler. And they are both there at the house. After a rainy day, there was a leak in the roof. 
So 10-year-old Catlo gets up into the attic to explore. You know, have a bit of a look around. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Old antiques, photographs, and, oh, some old roof tiles. Those will be useful. So he goes over to the roof tiles, and, hmm, behind them is something strange. A box. A mystery box. Now, the kid is smart, and he's seen Jumanji, so he knows not <laughs> to touch the box and instead go tell his dad. Now, the dad drags the box into the center of the room, and he opens it. And inside, a smaller box. But it's very <laughs> wow. curious because it is covered in hieroglyphs. So Lutz crosses his fingers, hoping nothing supernatural will happen. And he opens the inner box. Inside is a mummy. Oh my God. But there's more. There's also two smaller boxes. One the contained a death mask and the other a canopic jar. How? All right, so he might have a dead body in the house now. So naturally he calls the authorities. The police show up and ask some questions. Lutz then explains a little bit of backstory. He remembers that in the 1950s, his father went to Derna in Libya. There, he acquired a chest and had it shipped back home. <laughs> he remembers a conversation about it, but Grandfather Kettler insisted that it was a replica. 1999's the mummy. Replica. Son, son, son. Not a real mummified person. Now, at this point, the police did not think it was a real body, but it was worth getting it scanned just in case. Mm. So he loaded it up in his station wagon, and off he went to the Berlin Archaeological Institute. Dude. Now, they agreed to do a scan, and so they're fiddling with buttons and dials and stuff, and it's fake, right? It's fake? Well, here's where things get a little more dramatic. Results inconclusive. There is a fully formed skeleton here. Now, that is unusual for a fake. Often a fake will just be shaped like a person, then filled with sticks and cloth and rubbish. However, it got even stranger. They found that all of the bones were wrapped in some sort of metal plating or foil. But next they looked at the skull, and that's where things were the most odd. It was very realistic. Its teeth had roots. Its form was more intricate than the typical fake. It also had a laurel, but... Even more notably, there was an arrowhead lodged in the eye socket. Now that is very unusual for a fake. Dang. Hold on, I got more evidence to do. So they're doing more tests and stuff. All right, we've carbon tested the linen wraps. Yeah. What's the verdict? Well, those are from the 1900s. Now the plot is thickening. We have a supposed fake mummy, but with a very realistic skull, perhaps murdered by an arrow to the head and bandages that date to the modern day. That presents a new problem because it's not unheard of for people to do a murder in the modern day and then cover things up by disguising the body as an ancient artifact. For example, in the year 2000, there was a man who claimed he found the mummy of an ancient Persian princess, the daughter of Xerxes. However, huh. when they examined the body, they found it was, in fact, a potential murder victim from 1996 who died from bludgeoning. Oh, no. Right, so the police now actually have to get involved. And it's about to get even more complicated. So they confiscate the body and they do their own tests. And the results this time <laughs> say, no, <laughs> this thing is 2,000 years old. It's not fake at all. It's ancient. What? So eventually the experts all get together and go, okay, this is dumb. Yeah. Let's take it to Eppendorf University and have it properly tested and not just tested. Crack the thing open like a delicious kinder surprise. Hamburg. So this new set of experts gets to work. And when they open up the mummy. Be safe, all right, remember how we said that the bones were covered in a special type of foil or metal plating? Well, it turns out the scientists didn't quite get that right. Instead, the bones were sprayed with a metallic chemical that prevented x-rays from going through. I the see. The bones were made from plastic. It was an educational least, tool. The body was. Turns out the skull is real. Yes, a real skull and not from an ancient mummy, but from a 20th century man. However, it was not a murder. This skull is from a cadaver and it was medically prepared for educational purposes. 
<laughs> and what about that arrowhead? Well, it Fucking turns roller out coaster. that that's from a children's toy. Someone just popped that in the eye socket as a joke. So finally, the mystery was solved. It's just a plastic skeleton with a real dead guy's head put on it. Wait, how does that solve the mystery? Yeah. Anyway, Who's the dead so guy? Lutz was satisfied that the whole thing was fake and not a murder victim. Oh, let's put that back in the attic, he said very Germanly. But then, ah, eine bitte? Was ist das? He says, another box? Okay, dude, what do you have in your loft? <laughs> it's a bloody closet from Narnia up there. The Book of the Dead? Well, that sounds like a fun read. So Lutz starts reading the ancient Egyptian out loud. Anaxunamun, Emotep, Brendan Fraser. And what happened next will shock you and make for a very good thumbnail. Okay, that could have almost worked. Hey there, champ. You're probably wondering why I'm out here on this park bench. <laughs> Sometimes I just come to see the autumn leaves. Winter will be here soon. Dust in the wind. <sighs> Truth is, sport, I have a highly Highly contagious respiratory disease. I won't be around much longer. Dust in the wind. Ugh. I'm like <laughs> Willy Wonka from that movie. And you're like that ugly kid from the Willy Wonka movie who gets all his stuff. Or the Oompa Loompa. I don't know. I haven't seen it. <laughs> the point is you're so close to being fancy. I can feel it. There's just one lesson left to learn. Oh. <laughs> anyway, speaking of ancient Egypt, here's this ancient Egyptian gun. And Franz Ferdinand, what are you doing here? Of course, he's not the real Franz Ferdinand. He's a mummy. Please don't shoot Fred Ferdinand again. He's had enough. Now, the thing about the ancient Egyptian gun is that it's very... Nah. Uh-oh. I hit your congratulations for being somewhat fancy cake. <sighs> Come on, Mr. Ferdinand. We've got to clean this up before the Park Services Commission hears about this, and they make another complaint. Right, we're almost done with the series, and then it's back to the usual content. So in case you missed it, there's also Drinking on Incognito, a new story mode out next week. And if you like fancy, that's great. But if you don't like fancy, don't worry, it's not forever. <laughs> Goodbye. Ooh. Don't forget NordVPN, nordvpn.com slash internet a story. Huge deal on a two year plan, you'll love it. I'm a little bit surprised that in the mummification part that it didn't continue further with the animals and started talking about taxidermy. That would have been a, a bit interesting because that's one of the aspects that I have absolutely no idea about but I've always found to be quite interesting because <laughs> you know of the silly examples that you may have seen of people absolutely failing to do it properly and those that are quite uh, insanely beautiful. The You know, the type of like a massive reindeer that is hung on the home of somebody's grandpa's house. But regardless, it was fun to learn about these other days and please guys do make sure to go and like and or perhaps also subscribe to the Internet Historian if you aren't already. And of course, if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button and I wish you all to have a wonderful day. See you guys in the next one. Bye.